if you would, like the video for us and make sure that you are subscribed to the channel. Hit that notification bell so that you know when we go live. Chris, I guess let's let's go on and, and dive into it. We're already five minutes deep, so let's let's tackle the big story of the evening. Texas A&M 41, Alabama 38, and this was just a classic ball game. First off, kudos to CBS for actually getting uh, maybe the game of the year in the SEC because I would imagine the ratings on this are going to be gargantuan, just beyond anything that they could have expected going into the game considering it was an 18-point spread. Uh, Alabama, all the different streaks are are over, right? Saban yeah. is no longer undefeated against his assistants. He no longer has the 100-game winning streak against unranked teams, which I don't know that A&M deserve to be unranked, but if you look at their last two performances, uh, absolutely. Uh, like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, get, so. you get a lost to Arkansas, no big deal. You get be at home against Mississippi State, you yes. absolutely deserve to be unranked. But That's- it goes to show what the season is right now, right? That's right. Like it's, it, it, it's, it's a chaos season. It's uh, as as Josh Pate over at two four seven would say. It is a renaissance season. It's been insane. Uh, <laughs> Paul Feinbaum uh, was on this morning. He said Alabama's defense against A and M was disgraceful. No, no, I that that is somebody that was not watching exactly what happened. Okay, I, I'm going to spiel on this for just a second before I let you jump in, Chris, because I know that you want to. But it's okay. No, uh, they played very poorly. In the first half, Alabama did. Secondary was awful. Defensive line could not hold up against the run. And it looked like A&M had the perfect game plan. Once you got Jimbo Fisher out of his script that he had created for this game, Alabama was significantly more successful. In the second half, when Calzada was not hitting uh, those those crazy throws at just a ridiculous accuracy rate, when he got out of that, Alabama's defense had a ton of success it's just that they had dug themselves into such a hole that Alabama could not get out of it. You had to play almost perfect offense on the road in that environment, and that is really difficult to do to be able to dig yourself out of that hole. And then, of course, you give up the special teams touchdown after you get one of your own. It's just a, it's mayhem, absolute mayhem. But uh, they, Texas A&M did not get their first first down of the second half that was not provided via penalty until like three minutes left in the game. It was that that game tying drive. That's the first time that they actually earned a first down in the second half. So the defense actually put the clamps on. That that's what allowed Alabama to get back into the ball game. Uh, but this looked like a team that had prepped for Ole Miss for a very long time and did not even think about Texas A&M. I mean, it, it did not even think about them. So. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll let you jump in here. No, it's just strange. Uh, you brought that part up. I'm, I'm going to comment on that. It's strange to see a Nick Saban team look like they're not prepared. Yeah, he's and, been, and he's they, been talking they, about it all year. All and year. They, and they absolutely didn't look like they were prepared at all. It looked like he did. He jokes about, he, you know, not jokes because the guy didn't have a sense of humor at all. He he talks about how, oh, I don't like losing to anybody. But everybody knows, like, he doesn't want to lose to Lane. Right. Like, like that's somebody that he will give all the coach speak in the world, but he doesn't respect at all and, and doesn't like at all. And, and so I, I don't I just know think, about that, no, by the way. Yep. That's a hundred percent true. That's a hundred percent true. Everything else you see is just, that's all for the cameras. That's all. I'm not going to be openly an asshole, but you, you, you yeah, know, it, those people that don't I'm like somebody, but they're still going to say all the professional things about them. No, right? I guess, I guess you're right. Yeah. So, Anyway, there's he he didn't like anything. What would he like about Lane, by the way? What what would he like? I don't okay. I don't think that they because would hang out. I think that he likes uh, his football mind. I, I, I think I that. don't. I don't. I okay. Who cares about that? No, yeah, that agree. Agree. That's like that's that's irrelevant. <laughs> I I just I just think I just think that that you know he put so much into that that for the first time in a long time, maybe the first time you know you know in, in a real long time while at Alabama, he just said. I care about this game more than all the rest. And and the very next game, he just wasn't ready for. Yes. Yes, you're right. Mike G. that was 100% not prepared. And yeah. Jimbo and them were absolutely as prepared as I could see. Let me tell you the difference of this game. It was – Calzada was unbelievable. What Calzada did is nothing short of miraculous this week, yesterday. The thing that surprised me the most is – 
Mike Elko put together a defensive game plan that shook Alabama's oh, offense. Oh, yes. Oh. It caused Alabama to make mistakes that Alabama does not make. They fumbled the football. They jumped off sides, uh, false started more times than I could ever imagine an Alabama team doing. They were They were – Getting rattled. Young was overthrowing guys. He was underthrowing guys. Like his accuracy was all. I mean, he was. He looked like he was shooting with a shotgun and not with a with a sniper rifle like normal. It, it was just one of those situations where what Mike Elko did. Listen, all that money Jimbo got, Mike Elko better be standing over there waving his hands to all those A and M boosters saying, "Hey." That nine point five million, I I need to see my piece go up. We're going to oh, yeah. change the game for what assistants make. I know I'm already making more than most every assistant coach out there. I need to be making more than half the of the head coaches in in college football right now. Yes, at A and M, where 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 it really is a a football school, and they have the money to do anything in the world. Mike Elko needs to be the highest paid coordinator right now. That's in a world where Brett Villables is still probably the best defensive mind there. Doesn't matter. Results are all that matters. And I mean, Batman it might be one A, one B. Like it really might be. It, what oh, you, he did, you might be right. I just I've seen I've seen Vittables do it for so so long. Now the true. difference is I've seen Vittables do it against a caliber of opponent that's just not great all the time. So maybe that skews my uh, my mindset of him. It totally totally fair. What Elko was doing in that first half, especially where he Holy was bringing shit. where he was bringing two different defenders right up the middle, but he would bring them from different areas, and you didn't know he'd bring three guys up, and he would bring two, but you never knew exactly which ones were coming in, right? And every time he did it, nobody has tried that really on on Bryce Young this year. And and it completely shook Bryce Young. It completely shook well, him. It, I've, I've said this forever. It's really hard to do, and it's a gamble. Because when you miss, receivers go for 15, 20, 80 yards. doesn't matter. But the best help you can ever give your secondary is a great pass rush. Like, I, I've, I've told you before, if I could build a football team, and I had to be great at a position and weak at another position, which means you just can't be great everywhere. I would rather have a great front seven in a weak secondary, even in today's game of throwing the football, because so many quarterbacks don't, A, it's not just, well, this, I love it when people used to say, well, Tom Brady really hates it when you, when you come straight up the middle at him and you, and you, and you hit him in the mouth. Nobody likes getting hit in the mouth. No, like, like, I love it when commentators do that. Like, well, he really doesn't like that. Do you know a quarterback that likes standing in the pocket and getting their ass rocked? Because I, I don't. None. I don't know anybody that does that. And uh, uh, amazingly enough, Bryce Young doesn't like it. And yeah. when he gets hit a couple of times, amazingly, his throws, you don't have to cover guys. Alabama guys were wide open, and balls were bouncing on the ground in front of them are going yeah. way over their head. Well, because he didn't have time bounce. to set, right? He didn't well, have time to do I don't anything. think it was so, – because some of those throws, he had time. I think it was the two plays beforehand, he got put on the ground, he got hit really hard, and now I'm getting the ball out faster than I want to, and I'm not as accurate. Or I'm guessing where I think the receiver is going to be, and he's not really there yet. But that's what happens in football. That's why you have to pressure the quarterback. Yes. Yes. Uh, let me jump into these comments right quick. Larry Pilgrim just jumped in said, Morning, gents. Good to see everybody in here, of course. Uh, Big Smooth was getting ready to surf the YouTube and like a glorious sound, abracadabra. What's up, fella? <laughs> nice to see you, Big Smooth. And Mike G, how does the Mississippi State Calzada become this Calzada in one week? So here, here's the deal. This was the 11-year anniversary of uh, Steve Spurrier and... South Carolina and Steven Garcia having the game of their lives in Columbia against number one Alabama back in 2010. And Steven Garcia was not an all SEC quarterback. He was not even a, a good quarterback that year. Like he was serviceable, he was fine. But when you have athletes, when you have players that can make plays, so long as the quarterback is having an incredible ball game then yes, you were going to be able to make plays against an Alabama defense that, uh, for whatever reason, so at my, my dad actually sent me this last night, said it's obvious Alabama spent all of August and September working on uh, Ole Miss, and now they can't play their Rip Liz match man stuff anymore. They looked completely out of sorts in that first half, and part of it was because Calzada was hitting everything. Everything. I mean, it was unbelievable. that he He did not have a ball hit the ground in the first half. Like the only incompletion was an interception. 
Now, in the second half, they got everything kind of sorted away, but when you have such a magnificent first half, that second half, you're you're pulling from behind, and it's way tougher to come back from 14 down, and you need perfect execution in a hostile environment, and it's almost impossible to do. I mean, just right. it, it, it's you can't do it. Can't do it. The difference between this game and the Florida game for Alabama is Alabama went up 21 to three against Florida, and in this game they were down 17 to seven before you could snap your fingers. I mean, it was it was super super fast. So yeah, this this was interesting. It, it was it was very much a Stephen Garcia kind of game. Alabama outgained them 522 to 379. Uh, they outpassed them 369 to 285. They outrushed them 153 to 94. They held the football for 34 minutes compared to only 26 for A&M. But Alabama had two turnovers. They had eight penalties for 82 yards. They lost both of those battles. And they did not look uh, like a like a well-coached football team for the majority of that game. They, they, no, they just did made not mistakes take- that they normally don't make. Some of that, I think... I, I think the other team caused that. I think oh, yes, the, yes, I yes. will say this. The crowd noise caused it. Yes. They did some of this stuff they did at the swamp as well. This might be a thing where if they go on the road, they might not be as dominant as we expect. When they play at home, different story. Yeah. Still dominant. When they're on the road, they're not above getting beat because I think they could have lost, should have lost that Florida game. So so here is what the remaining schedule is, by the way, if we want to talk about road games. Uh at Mississippi State. Next week, night game. Going to be interesting, I think, in Starkville. And then you've got Tennessee at home, LSU at home, New Mexico State at home, Arkansas at home, and then at Auburn to end the year. So, we shall see what ends up happening there. The fourth down calls late in the game where, where Saban decided to go for field goals. He, I will tell you what he was thinking, right? The, the EPA risk there tells you you should have gone for those. Fourth and two, well, yes. fourth and two and a half, whatever. Uh, but Saban's thinking, and I understand where he was coming from, and if you look at it, like they did come back and grab a 38-31 lead. His defense had completely shut down A&M in the second half. The only points that they scored was on a 96-yard kickoff return. So the offense was not moving the football on them, and he thought, well, we just got to get the points here, and then we'll be fine. But, uh, I mean, it's... <laughs> What do you like? That's the problem, right? When when you have a first half like they had, and then you give up a, a special teams touchdown, you put yourself in a position where all they have to do is drive and score a touchdown to tie the game, and then you got a whole new ball game. It was thirty eight thirty eight. So it, you you have to take advantage of those situations when you can, uh, because you never know what's going to happen. Like it's nuts. It's nuts. Well, this is this is this is Saban being being bad with the analytics, but he's never – his team – So this is the problem with being so good is when you get into tight games, you're not used to this. You're not used to making these decisions, so you tend to make them wrong. Teams that are in tight games all the time because they're not as good have practice at these things. Yes. And 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 I'll tell you, I mean, it. you know, you, you can say what you want. That last touchdown wasn't a touchdown. It's 100% a false start. That false start was called on Ole Miss last week at – at Alabama where all the guys weren't set, but yet you snap the football, you throw the touchdown easily because nobody's guarding the guy. Yeah. Like, like you know, if you get that penalty, you're kicking another field goal because that's what Nick would have done because that's a safe thing because Nick only knows how to play it safe because he's used to destroying people. Yeah. He's not used to being in hard-fought games. And when he gets into tight games, he tends to make mistakes. Yes. No, you're you're right. You're 100 percent right. So this was uh this was eye opening. It was it was crazy. If you look at the advanced stats and all that post game win expectancy in this game, Texas A and M 90. percent This was not a fluke, even with all the yardage and all that. This oh, is exactly what happened. The, football game. Uh, here's, really did. the second half of the football, Bama fought hard to come back. They dominate the football game. Yes, the scoring opportunities in this. This will tell you all you need to know before we move on to the next one because we got we got a lot to run through and we don't want to take up the whole show with this, but yeah, scoring right. opportunities, times that Alabama got inside the A&M 40-yard line, they got in there nine times, only scored 30 points. Texas A&M got inside the Alabama 46 times, scored 31 points. That's all you that'll need to do. know. That's, like that'll, that's, that'll do that's, And that's ball game. Big Smooth said, uh, Gary, if you could, please pass a note to the athletic director to cover next week. Would be helpful, cuss word, cuss word. Uh, he said, I appreciate y'all, and is y'all's lunch invitation still open maybe next year? Yeah, why not? Sure. <laughs> We're always open for lunch. 
Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com, and if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter, at GaryWCE, at ChrisBGiannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com, or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.